You're listening to the Curiosity Collective podcast. I'm Arpita and I'm Deepika. The human juggernaut is permanently eroding Earth's ancient biosphere by a combination of forces that can be summarized by the acronym HIPPO, the animal HIPPO. H is for habitat destruction, including climate change forced by greenhouse gases. I is for the invasive species like the ants, the fire ants, the zebra mussels, and brome grasses, and pathogenic bacteria and viruses that are flooding every uh, country and at uh, an exponential rate. That's the I. The P, the first one in hippo, is for pollution. The second is for continued population, human population expansion. And the final letter of O is for over-harvesting, driving species into extinction by excessive hunting and fishing. The hippo juggernaut we have created, if unabated, is destined, according to the best estimates of ongoing biodiversity research, to reduce half of Earth's still surviving animal and plant species to extinction or critical endangerment by the end of the century. This is the biologist, naturalist, and writer, aka the father of biodiversity, E.O. Wilson, explaining how our collective human footprint is not only adversely affecting millions of species, but also our own survival and holistic well-being. And we use this quote from his famous TED Talk in our episode called Keeping Quiet to speak to the urgency of our current situation. And I felt like it would be a great quote to begin this conversation on transformative change in action because it immediately puts into perspective why we are here discussing the need for transformative thinking. I agree. Um, It puts down the urgency or the need for change very clearly. And I really like how it's an acronym, HIPPO, so that it makes it easy to remember. And yet I was thinking that it might be a good idea to review a bit of the history of this idea of transformative change in action, especially as we've been using that terminology, you know, right through the season. But more importantly, because it's what's needed in this moment. Yeah, so as I remember from my readings, the idea of transformative change began to evolve somewhere in the 1970s, uh, when the first research on planetary well-being began to come out. And it was becoming obvious that the aggregate effects of human activities were hitting planetary boundaries. So you had ideas like the carrying capacity emerge, which suggested that there are limits to the Earth's capacity to one, provide ecological resources that human societies need, and two, to absorb the waste they generate through the use of these resources. Both planetary boundaries and carrying capacity basically bring to fore the issue of scale. In other words, the aggregate scale of human activities at the global level cannot exceed certain limits. Yeah, and that's the idea around which the Earth Overshoot Day functions, right? Because basically the idea being that Earth Overshoot Day marks the date when humanity has exhausted nature's budget for the year. You're right. The Overshoot Day gives us a sense of how we are violating the Earth's carrying capacity. Yeah, and for 2020, for example, you know, that fell on August 22nd, which means that beyond this date, we're already dipping into resources that belong to the future. And as I see on their website, in less than nine months, Humanity has exhausted Earth's budget for the year. Now, because of the scientific phenomenon can be difficult to navigate, I felt like it's a nice way to understand what's going on. I agree. Tools such as these make it easier for a lot of us to understand the unsustainable nature of consumption that's leading to the multiple issues listed out as HIPPO. So yeah, emergent research since the 70s is showing us something that Naomi Klein in her book, This Changes Everything, pointed out rather straightforwardly. She said, Our economic system and our planetary system are now at war. Or more accurately, our economy is at war with many forms of life on Earth, including human life. What the climate needs to avoid collapse is a contraction in humanity's use of resources. What our economic model demands to avoid collapse is unfettered expansion. Only one of these sets of rules can be changed 
and it's not the laws of nature. And hence the case for massive change in how we live and conduct our individual and collective lives. Exactly. And like we said in our previous episode where we were discussing well-being, there are two aspects to the kind of change that has to be contemplated. The first is client says is simply that the nature of our current economies, which are based on high consumption and constant growth, are incompatible with the idea of planetary boundaries. And secondly, the measures of economic growth in themselves say little about the actual health and well-being of people, communities and ecosystems. So there's need to evolve thinking and doing, which also brings in social and environmental elements of well-being into the conversation to understand development. Yes, and the nature of change required at this moment to stave the flow of the multiple crises of our times, it's almost like a paradigm shift from how we've been living so far. It actually reminds me of a note from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPPES site, which speaks to transformative change and simply says it like this. Transformative change means doing things differently, not just a little more or less of something we're already doing. Truly transformative change is change that becomes sweeping. It often starts small, but it is strategic. It includes individual decisions to help start or build new social norms and the legal changes that unlock all kinds of other change. Yes, that is the simplest summary of it, really. And um, of course, the direction of these changes is towards mitigating and healing the damage that has been done by existing economic systems, even as we as a species evolve a system of living that allows for the thriving of all species and ecosystems. And I remember when we were thinking about this during TCC's more formative period, we were also asking that vital question which goes with this, which is, yes, we need transformative change, as you said, but also very important to address was how do I, a single individual, play a part in that? What does transformative change mean for me at the individual or community level? Of course, because frankly, it's what each of us was also wondering, right? I mean... There was this big looming reality and the obvious need to tackle it. But if it was so big, was it really possible to do anything through one individual's action? And I think we have to, the best possible extent, try to balance this in the conversations of season one. But we not only speak to some of these issues at hand, but also try to tease out what it was that each of us could do within our own individual capacity to make that difference. How do we understand transformative change and individual action within each of these issues? And frankly, you know, going in, I never imagined that there would be so much you could do. I think here we can begin with ourselves. And uh, well, some of the results are right there in your own house. You did the interviews for our four-part series on waste and consumerism. And at the beginning of that conversation, you were wondering why you had stopped composting. And by the end of it, not only were you composting, but you had made firm friends with our favorite black soldier flies and were inspiring a whole host of your friends to take it up as well. Yes, I never imagined it, but you know, maybe I should have because of all the conversations I was having. But really doing something with your own hands, something even as simple as taking five or ten minutes to segregate my waste, it's, it's profound. I think one of the insights for me was definitely this, that the overwhelming feeling of being powerless and helpless can quite surprisingly and immediately change when we take even a minute step towards actually doing something. Yes, that's spot on. And, you know, even that small step towards any form of action, whether it's picking up a book about an issue, you know, making a Google alert to stay informed about these subjects, or in my case, to begin again with a hands-on approach to my waste, it just makes things more immediate, I think. You know, you read about these huge cities with waste problems that run into, you know, thousands of tons and it, it all feels so big and overwhelming. That just You just want to look away. But if you look at your own waste and begin there, that's manageable. Yeah, in some ways, contracting the scale of a problem to your individual and community levels definitely helps one begin to respond and think about things differently. It feels less formidable to segregate your own waste instead of considering how tons of waste is to be managed. And I find this little trick useful, that if you must scale something, scale the outcome of your own action. Uh, for example, just a few days back on Insta, uh, I saw this daily dump post where they shared how if one family of four composts one kg of waste per day, 
it ends up saving 300 kgs of carbon emissions annually. And similarly, 20 families composting 20 kgs daily implies 6,000 kgs of carbon emission reduction annually. So, you know, by doing your little bit on a daily basis, an individual's action begins to aggregate. It does make a difference. I remember this coming up on my first visit to Versova as well, you know, to see the beach cleanup there being led by Afrosha. And even as I cleaned one small section of that beach, I could already see more and more waste coming in with every wave. And standing there, it felt like such a daunting task to be able to clean this, this long beach. But I was far from, you know, being alone in that sensation. My name is Akhilesh Bhargav. I have been a part of uh, Afros' team for the past three, three and a half years now. So I once met, uh, you know, Afros and uh, someone said that, you know, the, he's trying to handle a very big problem on Varsova Beach. I'd never been to the beach at Varsova. And uh, I met him in office and I told him that let's approach the chief minister and I think, you know, we need to sort his help. So Afros just said that, Akhilesh, why don't you come on the beach once? And the very, it was a Friday, I remember. And on Saturday morning, I went to the beach. It was raining heavily. You couldn't see anything. And I walked on the beach and I was just walking on plastic and I could not believe what was happening. And there I see a bunch of 50, 60 people working in crazy amount of rain, just trying to pick up plastic. And I think that was the day which kind of changed my life. And I said, oh my God, this is something which I, I actually thought that I, this could not be solved in a lifetime. If you would have seen Versa Beach at that point of time, that's what you would have thought. And here we are. So yes, truth be told, it didn't take a lifetime to clean the beach. They managed to clear something like 20 million tons of waste within a span of a few years and transform what basically looked like a gigantic garbage dump to an actual beach where turtles could nest. And that was the version of the beach that Akhilesh was pointing to as he said, here we are. And now Versova is known world over as one of the biggest beach cleanup efforts. And it started just with what Afros and his neighbor were doing by picking up garbage. But after a few years, it's transformed into a citizen's movement of change and multiple other beaches are also being cleaned up with the support of volunteers. And Greta Thunberg's story is also along similar lines, isn't it? In 2018, she was this lone kid on a sidewalk holding up a school strike for climate placard in front of the Swedish parliament. And now, just a few years later, she's the leader of one of the largest global movements that inspires millions to action and spans across so many countries. Absolutely. And it's not to say that, you know, all actions lead to the kind of results that Afros or Greta have had. But it's simply to say that individual action has the power to ignite change. Afros is a Gandhi and really both their stories remind me of that quote by Gandhi, which goes, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. And also if I can add, you know, for one of the most powerful things of being in that space was that the anxiety that had caught hold of me when I first saw what had accumulated on the beach, it dissipated with the actual doing of the work. You know, even, even as I worked in my demarcated corner, pulling out bits of plastic from the sand, in the movement of my limbs, in, you know, the simple, directed, repetitive action, my mind found release and comfort. Just the act, just being tired at the end of the day, yet feeling proud of the little I could do. The quiet solidarity of collective action, it, it overcame that feeling of helplessness that comes sometimes with just reading endless bits of news on how much garbage Mumbai produces. You know, journeys do begin with a single step. And in that single little step, I feel like something begins to shift. You're embracing a narrative of hope versus that of powerlessness. I agree. I, I think when we think of igniting change, it's not just external. A lot more of the work, it seems to me, is internal. A lot of us consider hope as something that comes from the circumstances around us. But really lately, I've been thinking how, how, about how hope is something we need to actively build within ourselves. And maybe when we take action, however small, that moves us closer to the things we care for, it's stoking that fire of hope within. You know, I remember being mesmerized by Paulo Freire when I was in college. And uh, in his book, Pedagogy of Hope, he makes this one statement. What can we do now in order to be able to do tomorrow what we are unable to do today? 
which really seems to capture the essence of how doing something in the now is a step towards enabling a future you hope for. Yes, and this was something we heard a lot from the people we spoke to through the season. For example, I was reminded of my chat with Padma Patil, who converted her entire apartment complex of some 1,300 homes to segregation and composting. And there was this part in our conversation where she explained why she prioritized giving her time and energy to community composting versus pursuing a lucrative job. In fact, I would have gone for work. I would have had a corporate life. But then I thought, what will I, how much money will I earn? Say 50 lakhs I make, keep it in my bank account for my son to enjoy over a period of his uh, lifetime. But then I thought, what is the use of that? bunch of paper if he doesn't have good earth to grow his veggies on have a good life have a good you know healthy life air that is already polluted so let me do my part maybe it is worth 50 lakhs more than a crore who knows this sentiment that Padma expresses of investing in the future and in the generations to come ahead of us by the kinds of actions she's undertaking today was powerfully present and repeated itself across our chats, I think. Uh, This idea of doing right by our children and our children's children. This idea of intergenerational justice, really. And not just in the context of the environment and ensuring that there are resources left behind to secure the future generations, but also with regard to the second element that we were speaking about, you know, in, in terms of how we take this unique opportunity to expand our understanding and action around what is well-being and to build a society based on principles of care. That's right. Uh, the conversations related to inclusion within the cities with Radhika Alkazi from Astha and Kavita Krishnamurti from Kili Kili, uh, those specifically were filled to the brim with the wisdom of how investing to make a city friendlier to its most vulnerable citizens. Um, in those conversations, it was children on the margins due to poverty and disability, uh, makes a better city for all of us. Absolutely, and I'm fully with them on this. You know, just being in Infinity Park in Chennai, I could see how a disabled-friendly children's park not only catered to disabled children, but very organically, you know, also attracted retired older people, whether it was for the pleasure of being around younger energies or to avail of the same support as the disabled. And it was a really profoundly insightful experience. You know, so much so that I think sometimes we forget that disability comes in different shapes and forms and is everyone's experience as one grows old. And in that sense, when we work to make a city friendly and inclusive to the most vulnerable, we're actually covering a large spectrum of need and care. But you know, there was this bit of the conversation with Radhika Alkazi, which we didn't put into the episode, but that was part of the conversation we had. And I'd asked her specifically what gave her hope considering these times. And mind you, this was in the middle of the lockdown-induced, you know, return migration crisis. And, you know, she was seeing poor and disabled children bearing the brunt of the situation. And yet this was her response. There's a lot of hope I have when I see all, I see children, um, you know, flowering. I see children gaining abilities. I see families becoming strong and advocating for themselves. I see mothers you know, reaching, becoming uh, leaders. I feel uh, as, and I've worked uh, with uh, people who were like children. So now today I see them as young adults. It's been that long. And it's a tremendous feeling of, uh, of hope that if we, that lots is possible. So I think that's what keeps me going, that it is possible. I see it every day. You know, this quality that Radhika is expressing there, this uh, ability to keep a gentle eye on the big picture, but concentrate one's energies in that which is near, concrete and doable. That seems to be the shared trait of these incredible people we were able to have in season one. You know, I remember asking S. Vishwanath of Biome Trust, who is one of the foremost authorities in the country on rainwater harvesting, Somewhat of a similar question on hope um, and how does, you know, just simply how does he continue to work when the big picture of water scarcity is looming overhead so forbiddingly dire? And he replied, smiling, that if one looked only at that, one might as well take to the bottle. 
And um, as his online moniker Zen Rain Man reflects, he's an ardent believer in Zen philosophy, and you can see that in his approach and conversation. It is very much situated within the practical realm of the immediate and the present, uh, the only place really anything can actually be done. Yes, you're right. This living in the smaller circle of immediacy of who we are and who we can work and build with is definitely present in multiple conversations around transformative change and action. But you know, now that you mentioned Vishwanath, there was a second element to his advice which I thought was profoundly useful. This bit where he suggested that it's not only breaking problems down to the individual level that helps, but also breaking it down for execution within that household helps. So the moment your attitude to the resource changes, then you find solutions. But what we have as Indians, especially, is a starting problem. We intellectualize an idea, we are not able to translate it to practical action. So the thing is to stick that 200 liter drum. Once you do that, you'll start to figure out how much water you're getting and how you're benefiting. And then slowly you can expand to connect all the other remaining pipes. Never think 100%, think 30%, 40% and how to build on it to reach 200. Once you do that, everything else will change for the better. And that's really what I was doing. Oh yeah, this I've been quoting to a lot of people around me. Because uh, I think often we knot ourselves into inaction when we try to do everything in one go. Trying to make a huge change all at once can be hard to undertake. For example, I remember trying to go straight into the hole my plastic use will not exceed the limits of this tiny glass bottle this year kind of challenge many years ago. And I failed so miserably that I almost gave up on even trying. Because it, it was really difficult to avoid all plastic. It shows up in all kinds of places that you hadn't imagined. I don't want to discourage everyone from this. There are some rare people who manage it at once, I'm sure. But I had serious trouble with it. Yeah, but I do know that better sense prevailed. <laughs> yeah, thankfully. Um, I, I just realized that I had to shift my approach to the situation. Instead of beginning with forsaking things altogether, I began by equipping myself. You know, the right durable cloth bag that folds up to be tiny and is easy to carry. Uh, the little bits of steel, reusable cutlery, or to even choose places which facilitate reusable items. Those kinds of things work better to help me incrementally do better. Small steps where I just kept learning and improvising towards my goal. You know, another element to this whole conversation on transformative change and action, which I think has been coming out of the episodes, is this idea of how we don't exist within a vacuum and our decisions on how we are present in this world, they do have consequences and meaning. And I remember especially thinking of this when I was reading Connected by Nicholas Christakis, where he explains the insights from his research and the amazing power of social networks and our profound influence on one another's lives. Yeah, you quoted him in the episode Connection in the Time of Corona, which, where he basically says that his research was showing how if your friend's friend's friend gained weight, you gained weight. Uh, or if your friend's friend's friend stopped smoking, you stopped smoking. And they discovered that if your friend's friend's friend became happy, you became happy. Which is basically a level of influence none of us is really aware of possessing as we go about life, sometimes almost on auto mode doing the things that we do. Yeah, and he says that most of us are usually only aware of our own immediate influence and we don't really realize that everything we think and feel and do or say can spread far beyond the people we know. But his research shows that we are as individuals inevitably a part of social networks and within them, we transcend ourselves, for good or ill, and become a part of something much larger. We are connected. And I remember especially being struck by this quote of his where he says, If we are connected to everyone else by six degrees, and we can influence them up to three degrees, then one way to think about ourselves is that each of us can reach about halfway to everyone else on the planet. That's massive, isn't it? It's, it's a whole different way of understanding how you can go from being two individuals cleaning a tiny patch of a dirty beach to thousands participating in a massive cleanup effort. And, uh, you know, we have influence whether we choose to actively solicit it or not. People around us are getting touched by the choices we make. 
It really makes you reconsider the idea of an individual being too small and insignificant a unit. But you know, I think there's a second element to this idea of connection and transformative change in action that I've been thinking about. Um, even as we consider the idea of how we are connected in profound ways with the people around us, equally powerful are the experiences of how we might be connected to ourselves and the larger environment about us. You remember how in our first episode on loneliness, Sonia said this bit on uh, how busyness or being busy is taking over our lives. Then I feel cities don't have that space for support because everyone's so busy traveling, everyone's so busy working, everyone's so busy then coping with the side effects of traveling and working that we don't we don't think of creating spaces for support. Um, and that's the, that's the tragedy of it. I was thinking how this being too busy is not only responsible for how we might lose out on human connection, but also how we connect with ourselves and the world around us. What you were saying before about the mere act of segregation becoming a powerful learning experience speaks to that power of attention, I think. Yes, definitely. I mean, our high consumption, high economic productivity based lives involves managing multiple mental and physical demands on our time. And, you know, just running through such busy schedules does mean that we aren't even aware of the trail of things that we're leaving in our wake. Um, and I remember Poonam Birka's story of Daily Dam pointing this out specifically. And Bangalore is full of these IT uh, things. Na? So when you go into a closed office, an air-conditioned office, there's no natural light, you're working in front of a computer, you have coffee on call, you have cold coffee on call, you have lipstick on call, whatever you have on call. You literally live in a bubble. You out, you go out, you're, you're on manicured lawns. There's water, sprinklers, all of it is taken care of. You drive, okay, through some shitty traffic and you reach home. But again, there you have enough, made enough money, so everything is like closed, right? You're not aware of the amount of mess that is accumulating because of the choices you're making. You're not aware. Even in, we we go for these, uh, you know, these uh, workshops in IT spaces and these big corporate offices. I have actually seen people just drop things into a dustbin like it doesn't matter. Whatever you bring your attention to, be it human or otherwise, is what gets nourished in our lives. For example, giving attention to what I am consuming and how, even for a really small part of my day, has a way of initiating other little changes in my life, I've noticed. Yes, definitely. I mean, just spotting that same packet of chips or toothpaste tube that I helped clean up from the beach or segregated from my waste into plastics. Spotting it in a store now changes my perception of that product. I can actually see that full cycle of it and it makes me rethink how I buy what I do. And I don't think we're alone in experiencing this. Each of the people we interviewed who are in their own ways, stalwarts of their fields, had a story of this kind to tell where you begin with a simple intention. Uh, like in your case, for example, it's about wanting to manage your waste better. But then the mere act of doing one thing begins to bring in all these non-linear insights one hadn't really considered. Like for you, it's quickly expanded from just waste management to making uh, you consider what you even bring into your home, how you consume and buy, what those values imply. Um, and in a similar way, I remember Vishwana telling us how wanting to build an ecologically friendly mud brick house changed his view of water. It started with us building our house in 94. And so we wanted to make it as eco-friendly as possible. So we were building with the earth. We had dug up a basement and we were building the house. But we could not access the urban utility water because the urban utility would not give you permission to draw water for construction of a house. It continues to be the practice. And so we were buying water from a tanker because we didn't want to drill a borewell. And at that point of time when we were... Uh, building this house, you, it was raining and then you could see that the, all the rainwater was running out into the drain and we had this tanker uh, for which we were paying money. 
and buying water. So we thought, hey, let's try and make sense of it. So started look at the rainfall patterns, rainfall intensities, and how much volume of rain falls on a particular site. And it, there was quite an aha moment because on our 30, 50 plot, it was about one and a half lakh liters of rainwater falling in a year. And we were just allowing it to go waste. So we started to do something about it, collect it, filter it, try to understand the quality, quantity, distribution. So therefore, rainwater harvesting started. Yeah, this is definitely true. And I think he referred to it as serendipity. But I think also that sometimes serendipity occurs more if we allow for certain conditions, really, following the flow of our learning and curiosity. And remember in some episode, you said that it's like there are all these conduits of entering the same conversation that we're part of. You know, someone enters it from a space of water, another from waste, another from building ecologically friendly homes, or wanting to reduce their consumption footprint. Someone wants to clean the local beach or someone cares about human well-being or mental health. And you know, superficially, they might seem like very separate issues. But really, as we're saying in the previous episode as well, they are all interconnected issues and part of the same giant tapestry of building well-being into our lives and our communities. And inevitably, entering one conduit means you eventually do bump and sweep into others. I remember how Poonam spoke of the serendipitous nature of this journey where she said how converting your kitchen waste into compost then organically pushes us to new avenues of considering our relationship with nature. And really, who's to say what magic takes place after that first hello to a tree? Which is pretty much also what happened with me. My compost now goes to the community garden space and like she said, it's organically opened up the idea of gardening and tending to my own very few pots on my tiny Mumbai ledge. Yeah, and the story is pretty much the same with me, really. Over the years, what feels like serendipity is really this journey of following the path that begins to unfold and then break out into so many more directions. I think I began my garden with a few rain lily seeds I picked from the roadside. And slowly as they grew, I almost felt compelled, you know, drawn into their world, you know, from understanding soil composition, the various kinds of creatures that interact with the plant, from butterflies to birds to mantises, watching seasonal flow, migration patterns. There's just so much knowledge and beauty all around us. I absolutely love this non-linearity of learning and doing that comes from this process. And some of our conversations really showcased how profound the insights can be. I think it's safe to say that this one from Savita Hirimat, a composting advocate, is one of my favorites. And if composting doesn't happen, what will happen in the world? You know, all they will be full of dead bodies. We have to think back and think, okay, what if there was nothing called composting on this planet? There wouldn't, there wouldn't have been life. So to understand that decay is as important as growth in life, you know, because these two are the two faces of the same coin called life. There has to be decay. There has to be growth. Okay. So for this decay, all these little creatures are invisible and invisible, you know, tangible and intangible ones. You know, all these are important. That's when we sort of begin to respect the interconnectivity of life. This is one thing I've realized. I would add that it's not just profound insight. There's also beauty, wonder, compassion. Emotions that add greatly to our lives. We heard of this from across our multiple conversations and club with recently emerging research on how these positive emotional experiences are beneficial to our lives. It really speaks powerfully to what you're saying here about connecting to the self and the world around us in these new and profound ways. You know, as we come to the end of season one of the Curiosity Collective podcast, um, it really has been a privilege and joy for us to have had these conversations with all these facets and insights, despite the challenges of the pandemic. And not just with the people we've brought to the episodes, I think, but also with those who have been part of our campaigns on our social media spaces, been a part of our Zoom workshops, and of course, our listeners. Really, I think the season has broken the skin of the seed that is TCC and you know, we hope to see it sprout further in coming days. And as three women struggling to make sense of who we are through these times, the expansion into a collective conversation really has been possibly the most therapeutic thing for us. 
And especially as we read the emails and messages that listeners and readers have sent us detailing how they've been inspired to reflection and action through TCC. Absolutely agree. It feels right, doesn't it, that we began this season with a conversation on loneliness and we close it by challenging our own. Uh, you know, I recently came across this article by Joanna Macy, the Buddhist environmentalist, where she outlines how there are three stories that are shaping the world during this period of crisis. The first story is the call for ignoring what is at hand and continue with business as usual. The second she terms the great unraveling, which refers to the ongoing collapse of living systems and structures as we're experiencing it right now. And the third and final one she calls the great turning. What she deems as the central adventure of our times, the, the transition to a life-sustaining society. Our hope here at TCC is to be rooted within and be a safe space for that third story, even as we ponder and negotiate the first two. We are so grateful that you joined and stayed with us through season one. We hope you will continue to stay connected with us till we return with season two. Our campaigns, workshops, conversations will continue on our social media spaces. So do continue to keep in touch. We always love hearing from you. And yes, stay healthy, stay safe. As we end season one, we would love to hear from you, dear listeners. What did you like? What did you think we can do better? What issues would you like covered in season two? On our website, www.thecuriositycollective.org, we have a short survey that covers these questions. Please do take the time to fill it out so that we can do better in season two. You can also share your thoughts with us at team at thecuriositycollective.org. Season one of TCC was an outcome of many generous conversations and actions. TCC advisors and TCC family, a very special thanks for having faith in us and for giving freely your ideas, time, energy and support. We couldn't have done this without you. Also to our extended network of family and friends who religiously listened, read, encouraged, and shared our work through these months, our heartfelt love and gratitude. This episode was made with the support of Srinidhi Raghavan and produced by the Bangalore Recording Company.